All right, I'm back. And we're, this time I'm here to talk about selling safe cannabis and how to implement a supplier approval program for retail owners. So whether you own a dispensary, a grocery store, or a gas station and you want to sell CBD or uh, THC products, cover the selection, evaluation, approval, and monitoring of suppliers. I know it's, well, actually it's not that hard to see actually. Um, so really it first starts with the demand for a new supplier and then you go down and you have a supplier identification and evaluation. Chip, typically there's, there's two documents that you're going to use at this point. Uh, one is a supplier questionnaire and one is a, uh, or a supplier checklist. And so a supplier questionnaire is generally uh, literally what it sounds like, a questionnaire where you're going to ask about all the, the different practices that they're, they're doing at that uh, supplier's location. Um, so making sure that maybe they have a HACCP plan in place, uh, seeing if they have any third-party certifications, do they have a COA for the product, uh, have, do they have uh, test results and things like that. Uh, the next part of the process is supplier selection and approval. So this is what you, we call your approved supplier list and this is exactly what it sounds like, a list of all your approved suppliers and it's going to have their name, contact information, uh, emergency contact information because remember uh, when you're when we're dealing with supplier approval programs the whole point is to uh, minimize the risk coming into your facility so if that that supplier has a recall or um, anything like that you need to have all that information handy um, the next step is supplier monitoring uh, this is typically done through what we call a supplier scorecard so you could grade things such as delivery time quality of the product the safety of the quality uh, safety of the product uh, and things like that and so generally there there's there's uh, pillars that you're scoring them to and it's either on it from an A to, to F or a 1 through 5 scale or something similar like that um, and then when there's an incident um, then we kind of go up here on the side and then there might be disengagement from that supplier so you might stop uh, wanting to use that supplier and then you kind of start this process over when you're vetting new suppliers to come in and replace that one or maybe you need a backup supplier to that original supplier and then the last step is supplier record retention um, so this is things like COA, letter of guarantee, audit results, specifications and, and things like that so all of the documentation that your supplier is giving to you at, that was probably part of that supplier checklist or a questionnaire that you sent them uh, when you first onboarded them. So why is the supplier approval uh, program important? Um, it's vital to ensuring the safety and quality of the products you as a retail owner are selling, right? So if, if a supplier has an issue, then you have an issue. Um, if, if they have a product that has something wrong with it and it has to have a recall, that means you have to have a recall, right? And you have to take all these uh, products off the shelves um, and con probably contact your customers. Um, so it's, it's good for mitigating recalls and withdrawals, reducing number of complaints, ensuring that you are selling only the safest and quiet, qu highest quality products, um, creates supply chain transparency, protects your brand and bottom line, and then increases your brand loyalty. So if you're if you never get anybody sick or never have any products that are low quality, then obviously your customers are going to keep coming to you. Um, so just continuing on with why a supplier approval program is important. Uh, this is a great example from the FDA. And so even though that the FDA does not have rules and regulations for CBD products or um, medical or marijuana products, medical or recreational, um, they do. Uh, still have recalls that go on. Um, so this example uh, was a recall of core organic watermelon CBD oil due to high lead results. And actually the, the lead results from this one I believe is from um, the droppers that um, were used. So the supplier of this manufacturer purchased these droppers for this tincture and it contaminated the product with lead. And so through that, whatever retailers were supplying that product had to have initiate that recall with that supplier. And, um, and obviously nobody wants to deal with that because the recalls are very costly and it, it does affect your brand. It doesn't just affect, affect the company that had the recall, but it affects the whole industry as a whole, right? And since cannabis is so new, um, there's a lot of people that are still 
weary of cannabis products and, and aren't sure if they want to try these things. Even if they are sick and, and they realize the medicinal benefits of it, um, they might be a little weary. And so when we have big recalls like this or, or any recalls really, then it puts a stain on the entire industry and it takes a dip. And I'll use the example from the food industry that we see all the time with uh, listeria and romaine lettuce or, or excuse me, E. coli and romaine lettuce. And every year the, that we have a, a huge recall or outbreak, um, the, that, the whole romaine lettuce industry and even not romaine lettuce, just the lettuce industry in general takes a hit. Um, same thing with Peanut Corporation of America back in 2009. That recall did not just affect Peanut Corporation of America, but it affected all the small peanut farmers as well. And of course, all the retailers that were selling that product. Okay, so let's talk about how to implement a supplier approval program. So I've identified four steps here. The first one is develop, second one assign, train, and then monitor. So we need to first develop a written supplier approval program. So when we say written, this is all the policies and procedures that go with the program. Uh, then we need to assign tasks to specific employees and designate backups. So making sure that if someone's out or if we lose someone, whether they um, got fired or uh, moved on to another job, we have backups in place so we're not left stranded. And then train all applicable, applicable employees on their assigned responsibilities and then monitor all suppliers continuously. And we're going to talk about each one of these steps on these next couple of slides. Uh, so step one, develop. What should be included in your supplier approval program? So we have uh, who is responsible, so who's responsible for managing the program, uh, risk assessments, so how the retailer, if, if you're a retailer, uh, perform a risk assessment to determine the risk associated with each supplier and product. So there's a supplier specific risk and then there's product specific risk. So if there's one supplier that has several different products, each one of those products is going to have a different risk ratio. Um, the other part is specifications, so how the retailer and supplier agree to product specifications. So um, are, is it required that with each batch there's a COA provided showing that it's tested um, to those spe uh, specifications or anything along those lines? Are they required to have a third party audit? Um, anything like that. Uh, the other part of the, the written supplier approval program is selecting, evaluating, and improving. So literally how you select your suppliers, how you evaluate your suppliers, and then how you approve your suppliers. Uh, from there, we need to make sure that we're monitoring them on a, at least an annual basis. And, and in CSQ, it, you have to do it at least annually. Uh, but really, you're going to be continuously monitoring your suppliers um, as you're receiving those, those uh, products you're making sure that it is exactly what you're getting. It matches those specifications, right? Um, so we're, we're kind of continuously doing it, but we need to have a really uh, in-depth uh, review of all of our suppliers at least once annually. And that's when we get into the supplier scorecard that I was talking about earlier. Um, and then of course, we need to have emergency suppliers. So one thing we learned with COVID is that uh, the, in the food industry and, and several other industries like dietary supplements, et cetera, were impacted greatly by um, suppliers not being able to supply their normal stuff. So things like gloves, um, ingredients, all of those things were affected by COVID and, and a lot of companies didn't have backup suppliers. So it means that they, they weren't able to uh, produce their products or sell their products like normal. Um, so having emergency suppliers in place uh, ensures things keep going, especially if you have a supplier that you no longer want to use because of a safety or quality issue. So let's talk about risk assessments. There's three ways, uh, three primary ways to do a risk assessment for suppliers. There's the multiple criteria based model, the two dimensional matrix of probability and uh, severity, and then the easy way. Um, so we're going to talk about each one of these individually. So this is the multiple criteria based model. This is probably uh, the more difficult uh, of, the, of the three. Um, so we're looking um, at things like safety and quality certifications, so do they have a GFSI or CGMP or CSQ certificate? Um, does we're looking at label claims and special cert, uh, certifications, so things such as GMO. Um, are they claiming that it's kosher? Are they claiming that it's organic? Or um, maybe if they have structure function claims, which uh, nobody should be doing in the cannabis industry yet. Um, but those are things that we're looking for to make sure that those label claims are correct and accurate. Um, the makeup of the product, 
does the supplier's product contain any allergens or similar ingredients that could be hazardous? Um, so things like gluten, maybe your, your customers have gluten sensitivity. Are they listing that stuff on the product? Um, does the supplier provide a COA or a COC? So what are your testing requirements? Um, the country of origin, so where is it coming from? A product that might be coming from uh, the United States might be a lot safer than a CBD product coming from China, for example. Um, history of fraud, so does this product have history of being economically adulterated? Um, so with the, the newness of the CBD industry and, and the cannabis industry as a whole, there's a lot of, lot of, there's not a lot of information about fraud, but it does happen. And so those are things you need to be weary of. Uh, the history of the supplier. So does, you know, you can literally do a Google search on your supplier and see if they've had any recalls, any withdrawals, any regulatory warnings, any complaints and things like that. We all want to take those into account when we're reviewing these, uh, uh, selecting and evaluating these suppliers. Uh, the amount of product to be purchased. So if you're produce, uh, purchasing small amounts compared to large amounts, obviously large amounts, there's, there's greater risk than with small amounts um, because if you're only buying 10, of, 10 units from that supplier, then you only have a chance of getting 10 people sick. When you're buying 1,000 units of a from a supplier, then you have a much more greater chance of, of getting other people sick. Um, and then with this whole multi-criteria-based model, and, and there's, there's a, you know, other criteria besides the one listed here. These are just the main ones we look at when doing supplier approval programs. But you can also weigh each one differently. So for example, safety and quality is probably going to weigh a lot higher than um, the, the makeup of the product or, or maybe the label claims that they're doing. Um, the testing requirements may weigh more than the requirements for country of origin and things like that. So each one of these different criteria can have a different weight to them. The next risk assessment model we're going to look at is the two-dimensional uh, matrix of probability and severe, severity. Um, and so you can kind of see here, this is very similar to HACCP, if you're familiar with HACCP. So we're taking uh, the frequency of occurrence and the, the hazard uh, categories, and we're looking at, e at that product and seeing uh, where it falls at on this. And so this is a little bit more opinionated uh, when you're doing a risk assessment. And so when you're doing these kinds of risk assessment, you should have people that are comp competent in doing risk assessments and that are familiar with the product that you're, you're talking about. So if I have someone on staff that's really good at extraction and, and approving, you know, and, and has a lot of knowledge about oils, he's probably not the best person to help me um, vet a supplier for edibles or things like that. So making sure we have a diverse team that's doing these risk assessments of, of competent, competent people. Com I don't know. And then we have the easy way. The easy way to do supplier approval programs. Um, in my picture, he, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. One of my favorite lines of all time. And uh, this is the easy way to do a supplier approval program is to have everyone at the same risk. So we're ha setting the bar at the highest standards. And this is a lot of times what grocery stores will do uh, for most of their suppliers. Now, for example, when they have smaller suppliers, they might have different requirements. But they're going to say, we want a COA and we want to make sure that you have a third party audit. So you as a retailer can say that because that that. Um, and as the industry grows and as there's more, more suppliers out there, the retailers are going to have uh, more pool, right? And they're going to be able to set these requirements and say, well, you know, you're not getting a third party audit. We don't want your product. I can't verify that it's safe. Or maybe you need to go out and do that audit. So the easy way is just to set everyone at the same risk level, which is the highest risk level that you've, you've recognized. And, and generally speaking, that is through a third party certification or something like that. Um, supplier questionnaire and supplier checklist. So essentially the same document and, and we're going to talk about just some of the things that should be included on these documents. Uh, once again, this is generally in the form of a questionnaire or a checklist um, and we're looking for the supplier information. So the company name, the address, the contact info, the product information. Um, so the product name, the specifications, the ingredients in the product, uh, some typical questions that are generally on these questionnaires. Uh, for example, other than the product being supplied, what other products are you manufacturing on site? So maybe they're not just producing CBD or, or cannabis products. Maybe they're also producing food and beverage products, traditional food and beverage products. 
So maybe we need to understand how uh, th what those food and beverage products are, so we know that they're, if they're producing allergens or not, and how how does that work with the with their CBD or cannabis line and and things like that. Uh, another question: Do you receive third party audits? Um, so are they getting certified by an independent uh, third party body? Uh, does your company have a HACCP plan or a food safety plan in place? Uh, does your company have a formal recall plan in place? Uh, obviously that's a big one because if this person is supplying you as a retailer and they don't have a recall plan in place, that makes you have so much greater risk. So you, that is uh, probably one of the number one things you want to make sure that they have. Um, are, are there any allergenic products produced at your facility? So similarly, like we were talking about early, understanding uh, how that interacts with the products that you're buying. Does the company utilize third-party warehouses to store their products? So if they're storing at a third-party warehouse, we need to understand if that warehouse is, is practicing safe uh, best practices, right? Um, because it, it's, still, it's still not in our control, so we can't verify that. Um, is third-party testing completed on all finished products? Um, or product batches, I should say, um, and um, we'll determine if that's required or not. That's up to you, um, unless it's a state requirement if we're dealing with uh, THC products. Uh, does your company have a supplier approval program? So similar to how you're approving your suppliers, they should be approving their suppliers, right? Um, so we have this trickle-down effect in the industry where uh, we want to make sure that the materials that they're getting in is, is good because if they're not, then that affects their product, which affects us, right? Um, some typical required documentation uh, includes apl applicable local licenses. Obviously, CBD um, and THC companies need to have licenses in the state that they're operating in. Uh, they need to have uh, some product specifications, any type of third-party certifications and, or audit results, and not just um, safety or quality certifications, but things like if they're claiming non-GMO, if they're claiming organic, and things like that. Um, certificate of analysis or certificate of conformance. So, uh, you know, is this product being tested before and, and you know, do we have that uh, record for, for us to review? A letter of guarantee. Uh, generally, that's in lieu of a COA. Uh, and considering how uh, new the cannabis industry is, I recommend getting a COA um, and not a letter of guarantee. However, um, that is a business decision that you should make. Um, additionally, the last uh, typical required documentation is a certificate of insurance and that we just want to make sure that that supplier is insured. Once again, if anything happens, uh, we're covered. So what should go on an approved supplier list? Um, the supplier name, the supplier contact information. Um, this could include billing, customer service, the account representative, uh, whoever that those, those important contacts are, uh, the list of approved products. So just approving a supplier uh, doesn't really do you any good if that supplier makes multiple products. Um, we want to make sure that we're saying that this supplier is approved for X, Y, and Z products, uh, maybe not for A, B, C, and D products, right? Um, and then we need to include that risk rating from that risk assessment that we did, unless we're holding all of our suppliers to the same uh, high criteria of needing to get a third-party certification. Uh, status of the supplier, so are they approved, are they denied, pending, are they emergency only, are they a temporary supplier, things like that. And then required uh, records, so once again, um, you know, maybe we need the COA, the audit results, uh, insurance, things like that. So all of that should be included in your, your approved supplier list. So that was, that was step one of the process, developing the, the, the processes and policies in place for supplier approval programs. Now we're moving to step two, which is assign. Uh, who is responsible? So first decide if one person or a department or multiple people or departments are going to be involved. Uh, if I would not recommend only having one person responsible for your supplier approval program. I recommend if, if you are going to have one main person to at least have a backup. Um, but it might be a whole department or team, depending on how big your company is. Uh, examples of possible personnel include uh, procurement or purchasing departments, uh, quality control and quality assurance, and then maybe your dispensary or retail manager. Uh, and then obviously establish a backup. We've, we've already discussed that. Step three is to train. So how, how to conduct an effective training. A uh, trainer must first demonstrate how to complete the assigned responsibility. 
explain why each step is essential to their assigned responsibility and the ultimate goal of providing safe and quality products. If our if our employees, if we just explain them to them the procedure and how to do it and not why they're doing it, they're not going to absorb that information as well. If we tell them why we're doing this process and it's because we want to make sure that we supply safe and quality products and that we don't want to kill anybody, um, that generally helps that employee make sure that they're following the SOP and doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, the trainer should verify that the trainees understand their responsibilities by allowing them to perform the task uh, while, the, while the trainer observes and provides feedback. Uh, if possible, backups should be cross-trained. So once again, we're just going back to not just relying on one person, but having backups as needed. And then once training is complete, the, training should, the trainer should document uh, that the training was completed and, and when it was completed, just for that record. Lastly, step four is monitoring. So how do we effectively monitor our suppliers? Um, we're looking for customer complaints. So maybe we have a, a customer come in and say, you know, this, this CBD tincture or this, this cannabis flower has an off taste or an off smell. Um, we would consider that a complaint. And, and you know, if it's a one-time issue, it might just be that customer, right? Um, but if, if there's two, three, four customers that are complaining about the same product, then we know it's an issue with our supplier. Uh, we need to verify that products meet expectations, so inspecting the goods upon receipt, uh, in-house testing if needed, um, external testing, so using the ISO 17025 accredited lab, and then second or third party audit results. And the difference between a second and third party audit, second party audit is if you, uh, for example, as the retailer is going out and, and doing the audit uh, on your supplier, a third party audit is if you were to use, uh, for example, one of our two uh, CSQ certified uh, certification bodies to go out and perform an audit on the facility. And then lastly, once again, kind of one big annual review to monitor our suppliers to one, make sure information is accurate and up to date and then to establish that supplier rating system or scorecard. So what should be included in a supplier scorecard? Uh, these are just some examples. Um, everybody's going to be looking at little dip, uh, different things and there could be things beyond this that you look at when you're reviewing your supplier. So things like cost, you know, how much is the product compared to other, other products in the market, availability, you know, is have you had issues with with getting uh, products from that supplier? Once again, uh, do we need to have a temporary supplier to back them up if they can't meet our requirements? Uh, delivery and lead time. So how's the lead time? Are, are deliveries made on time? Things like that. Uh, customer service. So how is their customer service? If you do have a problem with a supplier, um, how is it when you call? You know, are they are they helpful and, and try to mitigate the problem or do they just blow you off? Uh, complaints and issues. Uh, have they have any customer complaints or issues, whether um, from your from your clientele or others in the market? And then specifications. Does the supplier consistently supply products that meet the specifications that were agreed upon between the buyer and the supplier? And then once again, when you're doing this scorecard, they don't all have to be weighed the same. Obviously, uh, cost is important as a retailer, but it's probably not as important as making sure that the product is safe, right? So that might be weighed a lot less than, for example, complaints and things like that. So what have we learned? Uh, well, we didn't learn what CSQ is because I talked about that earlier, uh, but we did learn what a supplier approval program is, why a supplier approval program is important, and the four steps to implementing a supplier approval program, which are develop, assign, train, and monitor. Any questions? How frequently should we be monitoring? Uh, at minimum, annually, um, but you're continuously monitoring your suppliers, right? So when uh, you get a shipment in, you're, you're generally inspecting it to make sure that it, look, it meets the requirements. So you're, you're kind of always monitoring your suppliers, but you're doing that one big uh, annual review at least at least annually right and that's when you do the supplier scorecard and sit down and go okay for this past year how was the supplier and and how am i ranking them are we going to continue to use them or not do i need to go out and find somebody else the example with the lead in the uh, the tincture right 
how would that have been fixed with the supplier program? So if they would have um, got a COA or letter of guarantee or something from that supplier or vetted their supplier or had that supplier get audited, any of the supplier controls that we, we just went over, they could have mitigated that risk. Right, um, knowing that those drippers came from China and that the risk from from products like that coming from China have a little bit more risk, they might have been uh, more beneficial finding a, a supplier here in the U.S. or or Canada or something along those lines. Those are all things we need to look at, and and without evaluating your suppliers before you just accept them and, and a lot of times that's what people do is they just go out and go okay who's the cheapest who can get it to me the quickest there's a lot more things to look at than that um, so we're making sure that the product's safe we're making sure that it's it has meets the specifications that if there is testing that needs to be done it that they're doing that testing as CSQ progresses will there be a database that I can use for the vetting process and to verify one certificate yes Great question. So uh, CSQ does have a database of certified suppliers. So you as a retailer can at any moment in time go to that database and see what suppliers are certified. So if you are having an issue with a supplier, you can go to that database and see, okay, well, here are some suppliers that I know meet uh, the CSQ standards and maybe I want to use them because I know they're getting audited by an accredited third party body.